Thank you, everybody. Uh, thanks particularly for taking the trouble to come in today. I know it's a half term for a lot of people, so if you have come in specially, it's very much appreciated, and also for the colleagues from the university you've stayed on, um, and for anyone who's had to juggle commitments. So in terms of thinking about this presentation, I wanted to deliver a session that was applicable and relevant and although I work at the university I, I am a practitioner educational psychologist and my test of the usefulness of any training that I go to is normally whether or not I can apply it in practice so I'm pitching this very much at a practice rather than an academic level um, that said, uh, these skills are relevant to academic conversations, any conversations indeed, and uh, even conversations with partners. <laughs> so I hope there'll be something in it for everybody uh, that you'll find useful to your particular situation and context. So I'm going to start with talking about um, conversations about change. And when I came to write the blurb for this seminar, I plan to structure around these central concepts and the first one is that change is hard for anybody um, and I'll talk about a bit about that later on in turn but I'm sure you can all think about changes you've made in your own lives and how hard they might have been. Um, secondly the idea that professionals can help people think about behavioural change and I'll, again I'll give examples of what I mean by this. Thirdly, uh, I want to talk about the central role of empathy within motivational interviewing and indeed in any conversations about change. And finally, what I'll try and do throughout the discussion is to weave elements of motivational interviewing, the spirit, the uh, processes and the skills through these different concepts. So I'll start by just giving you a little potted history of motivational interviewing, which really begins in Norway. So William Miller, who's the chap in the middle there, that's Norway at the top, <laughs> um, was a clinical psychologist working in Mexico and he worked with groups of people that had been referred to his clinic, typically um, because of problems behaviour related to some form of substance abuse. So for example, if it was related to drinking, it might be to do with a drink driving offence or some form of criminal behaviour. And um, in articulating the approach he used to a group of psychologists in Helstad in Norway, um, William Miller essentially conceptualised the idea of motivational interviewing which then first appeared in academic literature again in the context of, of, of supporting people with problem drinking in 1983 and he then turned up with Stephen Rolnick who is the person at the bottom of the slide Stephen Rolnick is a South African clinical psychologist based in Wales and Rolnick's background was in healthcare in terms of things like treatment adherence um, and he met a William Miller at a conference and talked about how he'd applied his ideas from the, the drinking um, context uh, within a healthcare setting and they then collaborated to pr presume the first uh, book about motivational interviewing. So the first publication on the uh, right hand side there is, um, or your left hand side even, is, uh, was published in 1991 um, and since then there's been two further editions of the book and uh, the theory behind it and also the practice within it has developed significantly. Um, Essentially, the developments have been practitioner rather than theory driven, um, but it has been significantly re redefined in the subsequent volumes. And the most recent book, which is on the right, is, uh, really takes motivational interviewing back to its roots in Rogerian counselling in person centred uh, work and really emphasises those core aspects of genuineness empathy and unconditional positive regard. And I should also mention at this point that motivational interviewing has been extensively researched. 
At last count, there were over 750 randomised controlled trials of the, risk of the approach uh, across diverse domains, including drug and alcohol use, physical and mental health, diet and exercise, offending behaviour, and education, uh, and pretty much every other context you could think of. Um, however, the way in which it has been used across different contexts varies enormously. Um, and to some extent, the attention is shifting now to not does it work or does it not work, but why it works, what are the kind of active ingredients into it as to why it works. Um, so the most recent definition is within the 2012 book, and Miller and Rolnick talk about motivational interviewing as a person-centred counselling style for addressing the common problem of ambivalence about change. And in describing ambivalence, they would talk about thinking two ways about something, and I'll, I'll explain that a little bit more later on. But I did say that I would make this practice focused rather than academic, so I should perhaps at this point say a little bit about my own personal journey with motivational interviewing. So from an educational psychology perspective, I researched MI both for my master's and doctoral theses. I spent years kind of developing the approach with children and young people. But as MI has evolved um, and the relational skills within that uh, counselling interaction become more central. Over the last few years when I've had a more academic role and spent less time working directly with children and young people, um, I've had less opportunities to use MI in a directly therapeutic way. However, it's only fairly recently that I've realised just how useful it can be in conversations with adults and students and everybody really. And I think this is probably because the newest volume focus more on, on helping conversations. So I'm going to structure my talk today around the seven principles of motivational interviewing and they are written there in your handout so uh, they're not terribly easy to memorize which is why I've written them down um, but I would have to say that this paper the Blom Hoffman and Rose um, and indeed this single sheet of A4 has revolutionized my, revolutionized my practice as an educational psychologist so I'll say a bit more about this as I go on, but um, let's get started with principles. I should say as well that this approach was developed for school-based consultations, essentially with adults, but I think you'll understand as I go through that the principles are equally apl applicable to work with students. So. The first principle is that motivation or readiness to change is variable and can be influenced by the consultant's behaviour. So in other words, the way in which talk, we talk to people about doing things differently can be helpful or unhelpful. So let me give you an example. I might be working with a child who is withdrawn from the classroom for nearly all of his lessons to work with a teaching assistant. Now, I'm concerned about this because I know that there's extensive research evidence from Peter Blatchford, Rob Webster and colleagues at the Institute of Education which talks about the evidence for teaching assistant support and suggests that this current situation might not be uh, the most helpful model of working. Now, I may very well have the research behind me and feel good about waving the inclusion flag but to what extent is it helpful to present somebody in that situation with that evidence without thinking more about how I would do that? And to some extent, the, the caveman cartoon here might be quite apt because uh, there's a recent um, paper on evolutionary theory and motivational interviewing, and that actually pr proposes evolutionary reasons why people don't like being told what to do. So if you think of it in terms of a social order, if you're very compliant, it's hard to gain status. So if you keep 
following instructions and complying with, 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 with what you're told to do. From a, a, a behavioural perspective, you're essentially subservient and this would affect your position in a pack or tribe. So we don't like being told what to do. Um, so what's more, the teacher or the teaching assistant might not be at a stage of readiness to embrace change. Maybe they are not ready for the young person to come back into the classroom. Maybe it's a difficult class. Maybe there's an Ofsted in the process. Maybe it's SAT's term. Um, so there may be good reasons for maintaining the status quo. And they might think the child is making good progress with their learning outside of the lesson. Um, that the, the learning of others may be enhanced. Um, so, to some extent, until you, uh, before you can actually make a change, you have to be concerned about behaviour in question. So, uh, this model here talks about um, the stages of change, and it was originally developed uh, in the 80s, a lot, a lot around the time that motivational interviewing was first coming to prominence, by um, two more clinical psychologists, James Prochaska and Carlo Di Clemente, and they were interested in the processes of behavioural change. Uh, so they looked at all the different transcripts of therapeutic change, and actually they proposed uh, from that that people go through a series of stages when change in their behaviour. So, I mean, imagine, for example, having trying to have a conversation with a student about giving up drinking. Um, so even if their friends are worried about that, it might not be something that's particularly of a concern to them. So they might be pre-contemplative or you know, really not worrying about that, thinking well, it's just, you know, it's just something all students do, it's just something that I'm enjoying, it's part of my social life. And it might only be later on when the student finds that the drinking behaviour is incompatible with a professional role, that they start to think about change, they start to contemplate it, maybe prepare for it, and then take action. And even then, even if you take action to, um, so for example, if I, if I plan to eat, eat, eat more healthily, but then I find work is very busy and life is generally stressful, I might find it more difficult to maintain that behaviour and I might relapse. So. Um, that's the sort of linear, uh, the circular, circular model is one way of looking at it, but also it's, it's also presented as a spiral because um, Petrasca and Di Clemente suggest that if you do relapse, so if you, for example, give up smoking, uh, even if you decide that at that moment in time you're not going to try again, your experience of giving up once will put you in a different position to when you actually try uh, potentially to make another change. So it's much more sort of three-dimensional, the process of change. So in terms of principle one, people might not always be ready to make a change, even if it makes sense for to those around them to do that. And telling them just to make a change is unlikely to be a helpful way to proceed. So on to principle two, and we've talked a bit about why confrontational techniques might not be helpful and in fact increase resistance from consultees. So I'm going to spend some time within Principle 2 talking about um, empathy and empathic listening. So the concept of uh, empathy isn't a new one. So back in the 19th century, the American philosopher and essayist David, Henry David Thoreau proposed, could a greater miracle take place than for us to look through each other's eyes for an instant? Moving to the modern day, um, there's limited time today, so I won't show you this uh, clip from the Cleveland Clinic, uh, but if you have a look on YouTube at Cleveland Clinic and Empathy, um, it really is uh, profoundly moving stuff. It, it, so it explores a healthcare setting f through the eyes of the people working there and also receiving treatment and as, as well as it being taking up quite a lot of time I wouldn't want everyone leaving here in tears because it is but it really is a very good way of conveying the concept of empathy uh, from the comfort of your own room with your own box of tissues <laughs> and why is this important? Well there's research suggesting 
that empathy is central to the notion of a therapeutic alliance. Um, but more than that, uh, high empathy counsellors appear to have higher success rates regardless of their theory theoretical or orientation. So whatever modality they're using, if they're higher empathy, the, res the outcome results seem to be better. And on the contrary, low empathy counsellors uh, or confrontational counsellors, uh, that style is much more associated with things like high dropout, relapse, um, a weaker therapeutic alliance and less evidence of client change. So it's it, you know it's really important. There's increasing evidence that suggests um, empathy is at the centre of that. And here's another example. Um, I was recently sent this article by Judith Hooper uh, by a parent of a child with special educational needs, and the article talks about how the author first worked as a professional supporting parents of children with SEN, and then years later she found herself as that very parent and in the article she talks about being labelled as th or thought as a difficult parent and what that means and I'll just read this out because I think it's really powerful. A parent in touch with the weight of the responsibility towards their child. A parent who wakes up in the night and thinking what will happen to my child when I'm dead. A parent who knows they will always be their child's advocate and ambassador. A parent who has been told that their child's prognosis depends on their parental commitment and capacity for support. And a parent who is not necessarily expected to live this life. And I, that really kind of pulled me up sharp. And it made me think about how often parents are sometimes labelled pushy as difficult or difficult when they fight for their child's right to be included. How often they judged as falling short when they struggle to cope with their child's behaviour and how often do they avoid contact because they fear this judgement. So telling people what to do might not be the answer. Trying to understand people's predicament and their position might be much more helpful. So why are people ambivalent about change? Well, there's been some clues perhaps in the early uh, discussions, but uh, why? Uh, sometimes it's a mystery to us why people appear to persist with behaviours which make no sense to those around them, which can be dangerous, damaging or even life-threatening. Well, first of all, change is hard, and even if we really really want to make a change in our own lives. There's no guarantee that we'll be able to do it. Um, perhaps you can think of a change that you've made, tried to make in your own life, maybe to eat or drink less, maybe to spend less time on your phone, so I know that's one that I always tr struggle with, or get a be better work-life balance, i.e. checking emails on my phone. <laughs> uh, so it's hard to make the change and there are reasons why we get drawn back into that behaviour. Um, or even where our behaviour is sustained, so um, we might see drinking as problematic but there might be social benefits, there might be relaxation benefits and that might be something that's important to us. Um, and uh, similarly it's harder to keep, as I said before, it's harder to keep change going so if there's other stresses in our lives um, then our good intentions can go out the window. Uh, we can relapse and we can find ourselves at a different place on that wheel of change. Um, and there's also reasons uh, not to change which potentially make sense to the individual. So, for example, a student who is truanting from lessons might be avoiding conflict with a particular teacher or missing out on a subject which they struggle with. Uh, a Senko who insists that a child should not be educated within a mainstream setting might be worn down by patterns of the child's behaviour or genuinely wonder if the child's needs might be met, be met better met elsewhere. And in both cases, the people involved might feel two ways about that situation. So, from that perspective, I'm going to talk a little bit about how motivational interviewing fits into all of this. And in the most recent book, most Miller and Rolnick identified three main elements of motivational interviewing. Uh, the spirit, the skills and the processes. 
and I'm going to try and cover these some in, in more detail than others um, today in the context of this seminar. So I'm going to start with the spirit. And uh, it's essentially the central philosophy behind motivational interviewing. Um, it guides the way in which we would interact with people from an MI perspective and it has four key elements, acceptance, compassion, partnership and evocation. So I'll now go through those and try and explain each one in turn. So the first of principle within the spirit is acceptance and acceptance is very strongly linked to empathy. It involves trying to value the person for who they are, um, trying to see past their behaviour and not letting their behaviour define them, not being judgmental, um, trying to understand the situation through their eyes and to understand what else is going on for them and also why behaving in a certain way might make sense from their, their, their personal perspective, even if it doesn't to others. And the other aspect to acceptance is the idea about autonomy, uh, that it's up to the consultee to make decisions about change and that only they can make the change. So for example, we can suggest ways in which a teaching assistant might work differently to support a child, but only they can actually do it. We can't be there watching them. You know, when we walk out the door, it's got to be meaningful to that person to actually make that change. And only when it makes sense to them from their perspective will they do so. So the next um, element of the spirit is compassion. And uh, this involves acting in the best person's best interests. And I think it's possible to argue that as educators we, we generally do this. So as essentially when Miller and Rolnick put compassion into the spirit, it was to stop people kind of misusing it in kind of sales and things like that. So when I first saw this compassion strand come into the spirit, I, I wondered if we were, it, it, it was... Um, it was kind of covered by things like professional codes of conduct and um, uh, and things like that. But it made me think again: um, do, do we always have the uh, the client or the consult consultee's best interests? So, for example, if teachers are pushing students to get better grades, is it really about what the student wants, or is it about other? Is it to do with external pressures about what the school wants, about performance standards? Um, and also is insisting that a parent comes into a school uh, for a meeting about their child, uh, knowing that the parent themselves struggled when they were a student at the, pu uh, at the school, is that really likely to create a positive and open discussion? It's also not about, uh, about not manipulating um, people into our way of thinking. So for example, if I wanted to get my other half to do a job, uh, I might think that rather uh, than persuade or direct him to do it, um, I might think that that might not work, um, knowing what I know about evolutionary theory. So I might think, aha, I'll use the skills of MI and be extra empathic and he'll come round to my way of thinking and do the job. That wouldn't be within the spirit of MI, so of course I wouldn't do it. <laughs> so it's not, again, it's not a, about trying to get people round to our way of thinking. Um, it, it's not about trying to um, impose our worldview on somebody else through um, slightly manipulative means. So for example, um, to listen and reflect empathically with the aim of ultimately getting parents to agree to a referral to, of a child to the Child and Adolescent Mental Health Services for a diagnostic assessment. So it, it, that, that's not what it's about. Um, so, uh, evocation, uh, the next element, is about trying to help people find their own reasons for change. And these might be quite different to our own. 
Um, so for example, um, I might want a student to improve their attendance so they can get a better, better education. Uh, they might want to attend more because they, they would see their friends more often. So it's helpful to try and work out why the change would be important to that person um, and it's back to this idea that we can't change somebody's behaviour for them they have to want to do it so we need to look for reasons why that change would be meaningful to that person and finally um, within the motivational interviewing spirit is the idea of partnership so Miller and Rolnick define um, partnership um, as being between two, e motivational interviewing as a partnership between two experts and the professional might be the expert in the consultation process but the expert, the consultee is the expert in their own situation and in what is feasible and achievable from their own perspective. So again think about a consultation with a parent about a teacher who's a, t a teenager whose uh, punctuality is poor it's the parent who understands the working of the household in the morning why the te teenager is late up and out of the house and short of going and actually living in the house the professional can only support the parent to explore, explore solutions that are meaningful and achievable for them within that context people have their own reasons for sustaining behaviour. Ambiv ambivalence about change is normal. We're all ambivalent about change and nobody likes to change. Um, so, why is it not a good idea to argue for change? Particularly if we think we're in a position of knowing what is best for a person. So imagine a young person is going to be excluded from school. Surely it's our duty at the very least to point out the consequences of their behaviour and to argue for change. It seems right in principle, but the truth is people usually know. So imagine how well a conversation would go down with a colleague or friend if we're about to have, they're about to have a beer or a slice of cake and you pointed out the downsides to that behaviour. Um, an example from my own life, I like chocolate, I often eat chocolate late at night, I like to do this, I know it's not especially good for me, I already have an internal narrative which is about, related to ambivalence about the pros and cons of late night chocolate eating. So imagine if you were to grill me about my late night chocolate eating and point out its disadvantages. I might say, well, I don't eat that much, or I don't have any other bad habits, or I've earned it, I've had a rough day, or, well, I do a lot of sport, so it's okay for me to eat chocolate. I might get defensive. It might even tip the balance of my internal narrative. I might go home and just shove a whole bar in. <laughs> so imagine if, it was, if, I, if, if, if you were to say, you like eating chocolate at night. It's your little treat, and it's important to you. Think about the scales now. So I might try and tip the balance the other way. I might say, well, I do like it, but I wouldn't say it's, it's important. It's probably more of a habit and just a habit I've got into. And actually, I could probably just as easily eat some fruit and nuts, which would be a much healthier option. So instead of being defensive, I'm starting to think about my own uh, possibilities for changing that behaviour. And um, Miller and Rolnick warn about what they call the writing reflex and this is the idea that you would try and change a person's behaviour that you think is causing them problems. So if a student isn't working hard you might tell them so, you might make them stay late to complete their work that they haven't done, you might check every day that they're working as hard as you want them to and you do all of this because you want them to succeed. You do this for the right reasons, but in fact it might be counterproductive because they're not in charge of the change. You've taken away their sense of responsibility and not considered why it may or may not be important to them. But we often feel obliged to do the writing reflex. We often feel that we're not doing our job if we don't point it out. Sometimes knowing that the writing reflex is unlikely to be helpful can actually be quite liberating and can make conversations much more consultee focused and empathic. So principle four, if you're using the right writing reflex, 
the council team might get defensive and you might actually be tipping the scales in favour of sustaining a particular behaviour. So principle five is perhaps the principle which I find most useful to think about um, from the perspective of, of working as a practitioner. And it's to help consultees argue for change. Consultants must understand, accept and acknowledge the arguments for not changing. So what does this look like? Why might we not want to change? So, for example, the girl on the left of the slide might get a, sten a sense of status amongst her peers for difficult behaviour that she doesn't get from her achievement at school. And similarly, the boy on the right-hand side of this slide might have a good reason for maintaining his behaviour. And if by getting sent out of lessons, his classmates and teachers do not realise that he's struggling, um, it, it serves and it has an instrumental purpose to, to that behaviour. And to make a change, he would need to believe that that would be in his best interests. Two more examples. The teacher in this slide, they wanting to be inclusive, might recognise that the learning of other students might be affected by the presence of, of one particular student. And additionally, it might make an already stressful job more professionally validating if he is able to actually focus on the curriculum content and delivery rather than managing difficult behaviour. And this parent knows that letting her child watch TV late at night isn't ideal. Telling her won't help and is likely to make her more defensive. Allowing this to continue is a way of protecting time for herself. She is the person that when the situation becomes important enough, perhaps when the child can't get out of bed for school in the morning or is scared by something he watched, will be able to come up with solutions potentially about how that situation might work better. But it can be that we're not necessarily unhappy with the situation. Maybe we do not see it as a problem. Maybe we don't want to change or see it as a priority for change. So one thing that we can usefully do is help uh, consultees explore uh, the pros and cons of change in a neutral and non-judgmental way. Um, so uh, an example might be a young person who is on a part-time timetable and has been for some time and in terms of them coming back to school for increased hours or for a full-time placement, what would that look like? What would the pros and cons of that course of action be for the young person, for the consultee and for other people involved? And to some extent only by developing a rich picture of the factors which would facilitate and mitigate the extension to those school hours would people, the consultee and the consultant, actually be really well positioned to understand what the factors influencing that change and how that would work would potentially be. So it's not just about whether change is desirable. Miller and Rolnick talk about scaling for motivation and confidence to change. So in other words, it's not just necessarily about how much you want to change, but to what extent you feel you're able to change. Um, so for example, um, a, good, a good example from my um, experience of working with young people is young people that are involved in, in gangs and are, um, have the kind of threat of youth justice services or incarceration over their heads and actually um, they can be very highly motivated to get themselves out of that situation but in terms of their ability to, 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 to do that, to extricate themselves from the situation, that's often something that they don't feel able to do. So what additional support and resources need to be in place for that change to happen? Um, another example would be a teacher who's, who's under a great deal of stress would like to be more inclusive but genuinely feels that it's at this moment in time they would not be able to cope if the dynamics and the equilibrium of that classroom situation were changed. So principle five I think is, is perhaps you key to effective conversations until we understand people's reasons for not changing. 
whether they can change and what support they'd need to, to, to change. It's very difficult to actually think about how to move forward. So principle six is that consultees commit to change more readily if they convince themselves that change would make them better off. So this links very much back to ideas of acceptance and autonomy and that the consultee is the person responsible for making decisions about change. And uh, from a theoretical perspective, uh, it links very well to self-determination theory, which has long-standing associations with motivational interviewing. And this is based on the idea that um, motivation depends on the need to experience choice in the initiation and regulation of behaviour and reflects the desire of actions to be, determined, to be determined through one's own choices. And there's three components to self-determination theory. So let me describe how they relate to behavioural change. So at the top we've got autonomy and that's to do with the idea that the person owns the change, that they make decisions about change and they're in control of change and we've talked a bit about that. We've also talked about competence, the extent to which you feel you can make a change. Uh, so for example you might really want to uh, lose a bit of weight uh, so you can look and feel healthy, you're really motivated to do this, you want to be able to wear your old clothes and feel more confident and you might even say on a scale uh, in terms of your motivation you might say that you are a, a 9 or a 10 but actually in terms of how easy this is it, it's not easy at all um, it's um, there's, there's, there's life events which are taking over, you've got parties, social events and work is busy and it's hard to buy and prepare healthy food. It doesn't feel like much fun, it's really hard. And the third component is relatedness and that's to do with who wants to see a change. Are the people who are asking or wanting us to change important to us? Does their opinion matter to us? And if it does, the change might be more meaningful. So if you think of a student, if they don't identify with teachers or school staff and they're the people asking them to make a change, um, it, it, it might not be meaningful to them. Perhaps they don't see the adults working in schools as being like the adults that they know. Um, and do the students have other people in their life who are positive um, and motivated about education who see school as important and who will encourage them as learners potentially. So that's another important component of self-determination theory. And uh, a little um, analogy there is uh, self-determination theory and cake. So um, it's to do with, do I want to stop eating so much cake? Can, can I stop eating so much cake? And um, do people important to me want me to eat less cake? So in terms of a change, are, are all those conditions met? Autonomy, competence and relatedness. Okay, so against all this backdrop, how might we even go about us helping people to make changes which might be bet in their best interest. So we're not allowed to persuade, confront, plead, coerce or nag people into changing their behaviour. What can we do? Well, Miller and Rolnick talk about the skills of MI using the acronym AWS and potentially I think this is the most helpful slide of the session. Um, certainly it's something that's very easy to remember and the skills can be practiced and developed by everybody um, and can become an integral part of helping conversations. So AWS stands for open-ended questions, affirmations, reflections and summaries and there is research evidence which suggests all of these skills promote change talk which allow consultees to consider their motivation for change and I'll go through these in turn. So the first uh, is to ask 
open-ended questions. And just to clarify, uh, a closed question is one which limits responses usually to a yes or no answer. So, for example, do you help your child with their homework? And an open question would be one which opens up discussions. So, for example, tell me about the support your child needs to complete their homework. And there's some other examples. There are questions which open up discussions with consultees. So the A in ORS is um, related to affirmations. Now, this may seem straightforward, but it's actually a really important skill in motivation, motivational interviewing. And recent research suggests that while all of the skills promote change talk, only affirmations does what Miller and Rolnick describe as softening sustain talk and that's talk of continuing the current behaviour. Now people like affirmations, they like their skills recognised, they like to be told they're smart, they're diligent, they're caring, they're thoughtful, but affirmations are much more powerful if they're specific, evidence-based and genuine. And it's not always easy, but looking for affirmations, highlighting strengths, skills and resources, um, can potentially promote feelings of confidence about making changes. Okay, so on to reflections. Um, so here's a quote from Stephen Covey, who's the author of uh, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. Um, that might be uh, within a slightly different context, but this uh, quote is very helpful to me. Um, because it's made me realise that a lot of the time when I'm speaking to somebody, I'm thinking about what I'm going to say, not what the person that's speaking is actually saying. And that, I think, is quite commonplace, particularly within professional work, when we're thinking about what we need to ask and what we need, to, how we need to respond. And here's another way of looking at it. So, in his latest book, William Miller, uses this model from parent training to illustrate that um, the, the process of trying to listen to the meaning behind words. So in the diagram, the meaning of the speaker is conveyed through spoken words. Those are heard by the listener, but then it's up to the listener to try and um, think about the meaning behind those words. And I don't know if people have seen this poster campaign um, it within Network Rail, which is um, done by the Samaritans, but I thought that um, the uh, the message within that is potentially portrayed even more powerfully within that 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 campaign, and that highlights the need to hear the meaning be here, be, be behind the, the spoken words. So. Uh, I have to admit that I don't always make a perfect job of trying to understand people's world views, but I would say that um, using reflections has, uh, particularly within parent-teacher consultations, has revolutionised my practice. So I used to go in with a long list of questions uh, and rattle through them. Now I ask an open-ended question about how things are and then try and use reflections to keep the conversation going. Sometimes I might need to ask a quick question at the end about eyesight or hearing, but generally uh, using the same process I can elicit the information I need about how things are going for that young person in school um, and get the same information I would have got through from my schedule of questions, only the process feels much more empathic and consultee centred. And it also um, stops me from asking so many questions. And what I've realised from doing this is I'm an inherently nosy person. And quite often that I kind of ask questions which are related to my me just being nosy um, or, 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 or my own interests or agendas. So if there's something, you know, something about the child being sporty, I think, oh, this is interesting. And before we've known, we've, 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 you know, we spent five minutes talking about that. So it's my agenda rather than the consultees. And I obviously do ask questions, but MI has made me question why I'm asking a question and whether that is really necessary.
And finally, summary. So this is a way of pulling together information from the consultee that demonstrates that you've been listening and that you understand. And it also helps reflect feelings of ambivalence about a particular situation. So here's an example. You've put a lot of work into supporting Jacob. And as a result, he's making great progress with his reading, maths and handwriting. His excellent attendance suggests he is keen to come to school, and yet you're worried that he's increasingly isolated and has difficulties with social skills and understanding. At times, his aggression and behaviour make it difficult for you to teach the other children. So in a consultation with a, a teacher or a parent, I might do this three or four times during the course of the meeting, um, and it's useful in helping... Uh, me to check that I'm understanding the situation from the point of view of the consultee. Um, so to summarise principle six, people need to feel autonomous and competent about change. They may also need to feel that changes are valued by those that are important to them. And research has shown that using all skills can help consultees think about change and why it would be important for them and to take responsibility for change. So the final principle, principle seven, is the idea that consultees should decide on the focus of their goals and how these should be pursued. So information and choices are good, but once again this takes us back to the idea that it's change is the consultee's responsibility. We can't do it for them. So we've talked about the uh, spirit and skills. I haven't got much time today to talk about the processes, but I'll give you a brief outline because it does particularly relate to pr principle seven. So they're four uh, principles of um, MI, and these are hierarchical. So a lot of consultations go straight to the planning stage when you're trying to make a plan. Uh, Miller and Rolnick state that all of the other three processes should be undertaken first in that order and indeed that planning might actually happen if there is a lack of readiness for change remember in the trans theoretical model so in this model the key to the effective consultations is the, is the relationship is is engaging and that takes us right back to empathy and the all skills and only then should we work with a consultee to think about what their priority focus would be, considering reasons for and against change, and when change is sought, then to operationalise that through a planning stage. So again, a practice example, um, agreeing a pastoral support plan to pr promote, prevent a student being excluded may be meaningless unless there's an open discussion, perhaps using an MI approach, uh, about uh, what the pros and cons of that exclusion would be, about what the priority concerns are, so the focusing would look at the priority concerns and why uh, some behaviours are perceived as being particularly problematic for the student and for members of staff, and also what changes would need to take place from a school perspective to actually include that student and whether these changes are realistic and feasible. And then planning becomes much more tangible and operational and where it's not possible to get to the planning stage, systemic factors which might be contributing to the exclusion are highlighted. So, um, in relation to the seven principles, I hope I've done a reasonable job of outlining MI within consultation. I've hoped I've talked about why change for anybody is hard, why empathy is important, um, why, I know I've only touched on it briefly, but the, the spirit or the philosophy behind MI, the processes and the skills, and hopefully I've given you some ideas for how professionals can help people to think about behavioural change. Um, back to an academic bit. Uh, I should mention that um, MI, uh, motivational interviewing has been uh, an MIE research theme now for about a decade and a half and there is a body of existing uh, research which looks into other aspects of MI including theory, effectiveness and integrity 
um, in relation to student disaffection, student assessment and intervention and currently two of our doctoral trainees are looking at MI. One is looking at um, the use of MI. There's evidence within the US to suggest that MI actually pr promotes academic achievement. So she's doing a UK parallel study of that intervention. And um, another student is undertaking what will be the first ever empirical exploration of MI consultation within, uh, within school-based consultations. So I've put some references on the back of that, uh, that sheet, but please do contact me if you'd like any information about this body of work. Finally, um, for people who are interested in motivational interviewing, um, in collaboration with uh, Manchester Met Metropolitan University, uh, Greater Manchester NHS and Bright Futures Educational Trust, we've set up the Mantiva Manchester Motivational Interview Network, which is a multi-professional group which offers training and practitioner supports. The next meeting is next Wednesday, actually the 28th of February, 4 till 6, same time as, as now, in University of Place. And we're looking at motivation interviewing within written communication. There was an Eventbrite link, and that's now expired. But if anybody would like to call me, if you just email me, we'll make sure we sneak you in and, get you in, and, get in, and, and cater for you in terms of biscuits and tea. So the details for that are also on the sheet. And we're also launching a website. So if you link to the Twitter feed, you'll be able to see uh, when that goes live. And finally, it's half term week, it's nearly five o'clock. I'm sure that there are a lot of things you could have done rather than come to a lecture about how you can have more effective conversations with the people you work with. But you're here looking ways to develop your own practice and don't ever forget how amazing you are. Thank you. Clear and even though you and I have worked together on motivation interviews for a long time, I, I kind of got some new insights there. Oh, good. Yeah. Thank really you. Useful. Thank you. We've got some, some questions. Yeah, there's a lot of, um, there, there is a, it's, it's been written about quite extensively um, in the literature, the use of MI in consultation, also within um, program Im implementation. So, for example, um, people will be familiar with like the SEAL project, the SEAL project. So, there'll be parallel projects in the US where they've tried to implement a particular initiative within a school and they've used MI as a kind of coaching process to actually look at why people might not want so rather than saying well I like these bits of seal but I'm not going to do these bits so to actually take people through and give people the chance to explore uh, you know why the facilitators and barriers to effective implementation but none of it is empirical it's all um, you know we've written this model for this or it, uh, you know the seven principles again is a model for consultation but it's not um, empirically based or empirically researched so yes I'm quite excited about the fact that we will be actually getting some so the first piece of research will be um, educational psychologist views on whether they think um, MI is effective within consultations but then hopefully as the practice grows we'll be able to get more kind of empirical evidence about kind of outcomes for children and young people and how uh, people's perceptions of consultation is different when kind of all skills are at the heart of those those meetings. Yes, yeah. anyone can use it. So I mean, it's just about that empathic listening. So it's, I mean, it's 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 perfect for teachers because it's it's a way of um, trying to understand the behaviour. So a behaviour that seems um, confrontational or aggressive or uh, disruptive. Um, an, an MI lens would try and give you a perspective on why that behaviour is happening and to understand its kind of functionality for that for that young person. Is there research about teachers using it as well? Um, I wonder just whether it's more difficult for them to use it because 
lots of the systems around them mm. don't offer a lot of space for weighing things up and making your own decision. They're under pressure and so yeah, I, I mean, I, th I think, so the, 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 the reference, the, the Snape and Atkinson 2015 on the back of that looked at um, paraprofessionals using um, motivational interview in a direct way, but uh, I suppose to some extent there is the difference between using motivational interviewing for very formally and actually just thinking about which bits of this you could, it could, could embed within your practice. So it might be that you, you don't necessarily set out to go and do wholesale motivational interviewing in a direct therapeutic way with a young person, but it might be that you can just think about you know, am I asking lots of closed questions? Could I ask more open questions? Could I reflect and could I affirm rather than, um, you know, just that, just asking more and more questions? Could I reflect back? Could I really try and hear what that young person's saying and why, uh, what, you know, try and understand why they're feeling in the way they are? So I think it's, it, there's different ways of using it. You can use it at different levels. And I think, um, I mean, someone like Willie Miller would say that um, it's kind of a lifetime's work. And I I think there's some validity in that because it's you can you can use it at different levels, but it, 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 it is a skill. It is a sort of conversational therapeutic skill in a sense. So it's applicable to pretty much every situation, and clearly won't get it overnight. But I suppose it's just um, you know thinking about could I have asked that question in a different way? Could I have opened that out and really tried to understand the young person's perspective, or could I have used a reflection there to actually think about? Kind of, you know, to try and under, to try and check my understanding of the young person's situation and what they're what they're saying. Any more questions at this point? Lots of food for thought. Kathy, thank you very much indeed. You Pleasure. Uh, deserve at least one bar of chocolate. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. <laughs>